This is Chapter 21, Blood Vessels and Circulation. And we'll start with a brief introduction. So as we covered before, blood is flowing through a circuit, and that's why it's called circulation. And we covered in the last chapter how there are actually two circuits, the systemic circuit and the pulmonary circuit. In this chapter, we're actually focusing on the vessels themselves. So blood flows from the heart out through arteries. So arteries carry blood away from the heart. We also use the terminology artery supply, like arteries supply the brain with blood, arteries supply the liver with blood, etc. And then the blood passes through the capillaries, shown in both pictures, and then the blood is going to uh, go back through the veins to the heart. So veins carry blood back to the heart, and we use the terminology veins drain, like veins will drain the brain, veins will drain the liver, etc. And then capillaries in between the arteries and veins is where the exchange actually takes place between the nutrients and gases in the blood and what is in the uh, interstitial fluid or the fluid in the tissues. So capillaries are the only site of exchange between the blood and the rest of the tissues of the body. So again, uh, the focus of this chapter is going to be on the different types of vessels, arteries, capillaries, and veins couple of amazing facts to get you started. We have more than 10 billion capillaries and stretched end to end, their combined length would be more than 25,000 miles. And I put a couple of pictures up here um, from where they have injected uh, like a type of plasticky latex into all of the blood vessels of the body. So you can actually see just how extensive these capillary networks are. And this is why there's nowhere on your body that you can cut yourself and you won't bleed. And that is because of all of the capillaries. We are going to start with a discussion of vessel wall structure. And we'll also talk about some differences between arteries and veins. And capillaries are treated separately in another section because they are the most different from the other vessels. So vessel walls, and in this case we're talking mainly about the arteries and veins, have three layers. So the tunica intima is the innermost layer, and in our picture over here we're looking at an artery up here on the top left, and we're looking at a vein down here on the bottom right, and then this is a picture of what they look like in cross-section of a tissue. So the tunica intima will be this innermost layer that is shown in purple in both of these images. So this contains the endothelial lining, so that is that simple squamous lining uh, that lines all of the blood vessels and even the inside of the heart, and that is the dark purple portion shown in both of these images, and then there are some um, connective tissues underneath it which is shown in light purple. The arteries have an internal elastic membrane underneath their tunica intima, which is shown by the squiggly red line right here at the top left image. Um, veins do not have that uh, internal elastic membrane. So the next layer of the vessel wall is the tunica media, so think of media as middle. So this is the middlemost layer and it's shown in red in both images. And this layer is dominated by smooth muscle, so you can see all of these little spindle-shaped smooth muscle cells um, in both of these pictures for the artery and vein. Uh, notice that the artery has much more smooth muscle, and we'll cover that in a moment. And arteries also have an external elastic membrane that runs outside of their tunica media. So they basically, the tunica media and arteries is bordered by an elastic membrane, both on the inside and the outside. And then the final layer is shown in this beigey color, and that is the tunica externa. And this is basically a connective tissue sheath that surrounds the vessel. In arteries, the uh, tunica externa is made up of collagen and elastic fibers. The elastic fibers are shown by all of these little squiggly lines. And in veins, the uh, tunica externa is made up of collagen and elastic fibers, but you can also find some smooth muscle cells interspersed throughout the tunica externa and veins. And then the middle of both vessels is what we call the lumen. 
That is the middle uh, hole in the middle of the vessel where the blood will flow. So the layered walls of arteries and veins makes them too thick for any diffusion to occur from the bloodstream out into the body tissues. This is why exchange only takes place in capillaries because the arteries and veins are too thick. They have those three layers. So even the cells in the walls of large vessels, like all those smooth muscle cells, can't get to the blood that is in the lumen. So blood vessels have to have their own supply of blood and this is called the vasa fossorum, which in Latin means vessels of vessels. So these are blood vessels that supply the cells of the tunica media and the tunica externa of the large blood vessels. So here is a cutaway view. We can see the different layers. You have the tunica externa, which can also be called the adventitia, tunica media, tunica intima. And so again, this is too thick for, for these cells out here to get to the blood in the lumen. So they have their own blood supply, which is called the vasa fossorum, which you can see here. There's an artery and a vein, as well as a nerve called the nervi vasorum. And then here is another view, again, just to help you kind of picture this. Sometimes the vasa fossorum may come from branches from the lumen on the inside, or it may be an external supply, um, and it can be both arteries and veins. So some key differences between arteries and veins is uh, first the vessel wall. So if you notice in the cutaway of the artery and vein up here in the upper right picture, you can see that there is a clear difference in the thickness of the vessel wall. Arteries are much thicker in general, and that is because the tunica media of the arteries has more smooth muscle and elastic fibers in it than the tunica media of the veins. And this extra muscle in the artery walls helps arteries resist the higher pressures from the pumping heart. So remember, when the heart pumps and constricts, it's going to actually pump blood first out into the arteries. Right? Veins are way down the, the circuit. Remember, we go heart, arteries, capillaries, and then veins. So arteries are getting the highest pressure blood that is coming straight from the heart. So arteries have to deal with higher pressures. So having this thicker wall with extra muscles is one way they deal with those higher pressures. Another difference is the vessel lumen, which is the inner part of the vessel where the blood flows. In arteries, when you're looking at it in cross-section like this, the lumen will appear smaller and rounder. So when it's not full of blood, all of these smooth muscle cells constrict, and that makes the opening more narrow. Now, because they do have a lot of elastic tissue, they can stretch when blood is actually going through them, but in a cross-section like this where blood is not present, the lumen of the artery will appear smaller. Veins will also appear not only larger, but kind of collapsed and flattened in a cross-section of tissue. And again, that's because they don't have as thick of a wall to hold their structure rigid and circular. Another difference is the vessel lining. So in arteries, because they do have all this muscle that can constrict, the endothelial layer can fold when the artery is con uh, contracted, and that is shown in this image down here, with the endothelial layer is shown right here, and it can kind of have like this little ridged appearance, um, which is shown by this elastic membrane here that is shown by the red squiggly line, and you don't see that inside veins. And another key difference is that veins have valves, we're going to talk about exactly why later on uh, in this lecture, but as an introduction, the valves prevent the backflow of blood because the pressures in veins are too low to keep the blood moving in one direction, and the valves are actually just extensions of the tunica intima, as shown here in this picture. So here is a summary table that compares the vessel walls between arteries and veins. So their general appearance, arteries usually round with relatively thick walls, veins usually flattened or collapsed with relatively thin walls. The tunica intima, the endothelium is usually rippled in arteries due to the vessel constriction. It's often smooth in veins. And you can see that in this image too with the uh, squiggly dark purple line versus the smooth dark purple line in the vein. The internal elastic membrane is only present in arteries, not veins. The tunica media in the typical artery is thick with lots of smooth muscle cells. 
in the vein. It is thin. It still has smooth muscle cells, but just not as many. You also have collagen fibers and veins and elastic fibers in arteries. And the external elastic membrane is present in arteries, but not veins. And then finally, the tunica externa. Both have collagen and elastic fibers, but veins do have a couple of smooth muscle cells scattered throughout. And then they didn't put it on the chart, but if you look at valves, arteries do not have valves and veins do. In this section, we're going to go into more detail on arteries and talk about the three types of arteries and also arteriosclerosis and aneurysms. So there are three main types of arteries, elastic arteries, muscular arteries, and arterioles. And we're going to go into more detail on those three types starting on the next slide. But first, I wanted to introduce you to two important characteristics of most of the arteries. So first is elasticity. This allows for the vessel diameter, so how big the lumen is, to change passively. So elasticity is a passive change in diameter. And this, these are changes that are in response to the blood pressure from the heart pumping, as I was describing earlier. And we've already mentioned this in Chapter 20 when we talked about elastic rebound. And so with elastic rebound, you have expansion of an artery immediately after ventricular systole, so after the ventricles contract. And then the, after the arteries expand, they will rebound back into their normal shape, and this helps to push the blood toward the capillaries. So we looked at this in Chapter 20 as a mechanism by which the blood gets into the coronary arteries, but it also helps to push the blood toward the capillaries as well. So here is another picture to help you visualize this. So when the heart contracts and the blood is pumped into the arteries, particularly those largest arteries that first come out of the heart, the arteries have this elasticity. So they have these elastic fibers that allow them to increase in size. And then when the heart relaxes and that pressure of the blood being ejected is gone, the elastic fibers in the arteries rebounds just like if you stretch a rubber band and then let go of it and that helps to push the blood forward into the arterioles and then the capillaries and then we talked in chapter 20 about it also helps to push the blood out into the uh, coronary arteries. The other important characteristic of arteries is contractility. This allows for the vessel diameter to change actively. So elasticity is a change in diameter that is passive, meaning there's no contraction or anything. It's just, well, there's a contraction of the heart, but there's no contraction inside the artery. And with contractility, you can actually have contraction of the muscle in the arteries. So with vasoconstriction, you have contraction of the arteries, and this is going to narrow the diameter. And with vasodilation, you have relaxation of the arteries, which will increase the diameter. And the degree of constriction or dilation in the arteries can affect several things that we're going to go into more details with later. But these include the peripheral blood pressure. So the smaller the diameter, as we'll see later, the higher the blood pressure. And the peripheral blood pressure, the systemic blood pressure, will also affect the afterload on the heart, as we talked about in Chapter 20. So the systemic blood pressure pushes back on those semilunar valves, and the afterload is how much force is required to open those semilunar valves against that pressure pushing back on the other side. And then the degree of constriction or dilation can also affect capillary blood flow, as we'll see later when we look at capillary beds. Vessel contractility is also an important feature for hemostasis, which is we uh, covered in Chapter 19. And so remember, the first stage of hemostasis was vascular spasm, and vascular spasm wouldn't be possible without this characteristic of contractility. So now let's look at the three major types of arteries. There are elastic arteries, muscular arteries, and arterioles, and we're going to start with the elastic arteries. These are the big guys. They can have diameters up to one inch uh, in wide, and these are going to include your really big arteries like the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, and then their major branches like the right and left pulmonary arteries, and then those first three branches off of the aorta, um, the common carotid, the subclavian, and the brachiocephalic trunk. So this is the really big arteries. These carry large volumes of blood, and the tunica 
media in the elastic arteries is mostly elastic fibers, which allows these arteries to have that elastic rebound that we just looked at. Having this ability to have this elastic rebound helps to cushion those pressure changes between when the heart contracts and the heart relaxes, so between systole and diastole. And by cushioning those pressure changes, by the time the blood gets out to the capillaries, the blood pressure is relatively steady at that point. So then we have muscular arteries, and these are going to be most of the major arteries out in the body you've heard of, like the femoral arteries, uh, the brachial arteries, the mesenteric arteries. And these are going to be your distribution arteries that are taking blood out to the different um, parts of the body. And the tunica media of these guys is going to be mostly made up of smooth muscle. So the elastic arteries have more elastic fibers, that's why they're called elastic arteries, and the muscular arteries have more smooth muscle, that's why they're called muscular arteries. Your muscular arteries are typically your pressure points, so if someone is uh, bleeding uncontrollably, these are the arteries that you put pressure on to slow blood loss. So these are the areas of the body where like, you would apply a, a tourniquet or you would put active pressure to help control bleeding. And then your arterioles are your smallest type of artery, and it's shown down here at the bottom. These guys have a poorly defined tunica externa, so they're mostly just tunica media and tunica intima. And the arterioles are called the resistance vessels. And we're going to go into more detail on what resistance is later on, but to give you a quick early definition, resistance is any force that can oppose blood flow. So it's a force in opposition to the smooth flowing of the blood. And arterioles are the vessels that vasoconstrict or vasodilate most often, so they have a big uh, influence on the resistance to blood flow. So for example, it is harder to push blood through a more narrow diameter, so vasoconstriction would increase resistance. So the arterioles, because they're the ones that change their diameter the most often, are called the resistance vessels. So let's talk about two conditions related to arteries, and the first one is commonly called hardening of the arteries, but the clinical term is actually arteriosclerosis, and this is a thickening and toughening of arterial walls. So remember, arteries are both elastic and contractile, and so if you have a thickening and toughening of their walls, that's going to make them less elastic and contractile. Coronary artery disease, CAD, is arteriosclerosis of the coronary arteries, which we talked about in Chapter 20. Arteriosclerosis of arteries supplying the brain can also lead to cerebrovascular accidents, which is another name for strokes. There are two major types of arteriosclerosis. The first one is atherosclerosis. This is the formation of lipid deposits called plaques in the tunica media of arteries. It can also eventually cause damage to the endothelial lining, which is part of the tunica intima. This is the most common type of arteriosclerosis. The other type is called focal calcification, and this involves the deposit of calcium salts following the gradual dege degeneration of smooth muscle in the tunica media. So atherosclerosis is the um, formation of lipid deposits inside the tunica media. Focal calcification is the buildup of calcium in the tunica media. So small amounts of the calcification are actually part of the normal aging process, but a more pathological version can also develop in conjunction with atherosclerosis. So here's a little picture just to show you the difference. So plaques are these really large lipid formations that develop within the walls of the arteries, and then with the focal calcification, you just get calcium deposits scattered around the tunica media. So we'll look a little bit more detail at the atherosclerotic plaques. So these are part of an inflammatory process. All of the steps are not yet well known. It's still an active subject of research, but we know that it involves an inflammatory reaction, and we also know it involves low-density lipoprotein, or LDL cholesterol. Um, and so the LDL cholesterol gets deposited into the tunica media of arteries, and this is why your doctor is always uh, probably on your case about your LDL cholesterol levels if they're too high. 
So up here you can see the normal artery, you can see uh, the atherosclerotic plaque buildup, and then you can see that it, it becomes, not only does it narrow the artery and make it easier for the artery to become blocked, but the plaque itself can rupture and produce its own clot. So risk factors for atherosclerotic plaques are age and sex. So your risk increases the older you get. And men have a higher risk because estrogen seems to slow the development of the atherosclerotic plaques, but then women's risk will go up after menopause. Having high blood cholesterol levels, particularly the LDL cholesterol, is a high risk factor. Having a high blood pressure, cigarette smoking, diabetes mellitus, especially type 2, Obesity and stress are all risk factors, and stress is because it can uh, cause your inflammatory response, and we know that this starts with an inflammatory response. So when the plaques rupture, they can generate blood clots, and so the blood can either be clotted right there at that location, or the clot can also come loose and go elsewhere, like if it goes into the brain, that would cause a stroke. So to reduce your risk of atherosclerotic plaques, reduce your dietary intake of cholesterol and saturated fat, stop smoking, maintain a healthy blood pressure, check your blood cholesterol levels annually, control your weight, exercise regularly. So an aneurysm is another condition involving arteries, and this is a bulge in the weakened wall of an artery. So here you can see two different types of aneurysms. They can form like little bubbles that stick out, or it can be an entire section of an artery that swells up. And of course, the danger is when they rupture. And so an aneurysm is going to occur when the local pressure, so the local uh, blood pressure, this, these particular areas, exceeds the capacity of the vessel wall to oppose that pressure. So, of course, the biggest risk factor is then going to be high blood pressure. And then a ruptured aneurysm can result in fatal bleeding, especially depending on which artery you have the aneurysm in. The most dangerous aneurysm regions are in the brain and the aorta. So with an aorta aneurysm, you can have one in the thoracic region, so the aorta uh, soon after it comes out of the heart. You can also have an abdominal aorta, which is uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, which is farther down on your descending aorta. Aortic aneurysms are usually uh, fatal like within a minute or two because they carry such a large amount of blood that you bleed out before you even know you have had a, a ruptured aneurysm. Cerebral aneurysms are going to be aneurysms that take place in the brain. And again, depending on which artery is affected, this could lead to anything from a mild to a major stroke. So the two biggest risk factors for aneurysms are high blood pressure and smoking. And if you haven't noticed so far, uh, there are benefits to controlling your blood pressure. So if you do have high blood pressure, please go get seen about it. It's estimated that only about half of people with high blood pressure have their condition under control. And just lowering your uh, blood pressure by 10 to 13 millimeters mercury can reduce your risk for stroke, coronary arter artery disease, deaths from cardiovascular disease, and then things like aneurysms. So it is very important to maintain a healthy blood pressure. In this section, we're going to talk about capillaries, and there are two major types of capillaries, and we'll also talk about capillary beds. So capillaries are the real workhorses of the cardiovascular system. Most people immediately think of the heart and the large vessels like the vena cava and the aorta, but it's the capillaries where all of the exchange takes place. So these are the smallest vessels. They are barely the diameter of a single red blood cell. And in chapter 19, I showed you a video of red blood cells passing through capillaries so you could see just how small they were. And few cells in the body are farther away than 125 micrometers from a capillary. So again, this should tell you just how numerous and widespread the capillaries are, where most cells in your body are very close to a capillary. And capillaries are the only vessels whose walls permit exchange between blood and interstitial fluid. So I'm going to repeat, capillaries are the only vessels where you can have exchange between what is in the blood and what is in the interstitial fluid. Exchange does not happen across the thick vessel walls of arteries or veins, 
only in capillaries. So capillaries are essentially a very thin lining that separate the blood and the interstitial fluid. There is no tunica media or tunica externa in capillaries, as you can see down here at the bottom. Capillaries are essentially just an endothelial lining, so those simple squamous cells, and then a thin basement membrane. And so here's a picture, again, just to show you that they are a thin endothelial cell uh, wall, which is so it's only like one cell thick. So it's not a very far distance for oxygen and nutrients and carbon dioxide and waste to be able to be exchanged between the interstitial fluid and the blood inside the capillary. So there are two major types of capillaries, and the first type is a continuous capillary. This is the most common type, and this type is found in all tissues of the body except for epithelia and cartilage, where if you remember from Chapter 4 in a and 1, these are two types of avascular tissues, meaning they do not have any blood vessels, so therefore they would not have capillaries either. So with the continuous capillaries, the endothelium, which is that layer of uh, simple squamous cells, the endothelium is a complete lining, me meaning it goes all the way around, and all of the cells uh, are right up against each other and touch each other, and so basically the cells are forming a single-celled solid border between the lumen of the blood vessel and the interstitial fluid. So this type of capillary does permit diffusion of water, small solutes, and lipid-soluble substances. So basically anything that can cross the plasma membrane can diffuse from the lumen out to the interstitial fluid and back. So you have diffusion across the endothelial cell. But it also helps to prevent the loss of blood cells and plasma proteins. So blood cells and the plasma proteins that we talked about in chapter 19 are too large to cross over this uh, endothelial cell. So they stay inside the blood, they stay inside the lumen. You also can have some bulk transport in continuous capillaries in some areas of the body. And bulk transport is when you have movement of materials by endocytosis and or exocytosis. So in this little picture here, you can see these little endosomes. These would be taking little packets of material from the blood and the lumen, and then it'll cross the endothelial cell to the other side where it will be released onto the other side. So that is a type of bulk transport that can also occur in continuous capillaries. But the primary transport in endothelial capillaries is going to be just diffusion across this space of water, small solutes, and lipid-soluble substances. There are some specialized continuous capillaries that have tight junctions between one cell and another to restrict the amount of permeability and to restrict what can diffuse across the border. And an example of this is the blood-brain barrier that we talked about uh, in a and 1. The other major type of capillary is a fenestrated capillary. So with the fenestrated capillary, we again have the endothelial layer in the basement membrane, but if we cut away a bit of the basement membrane, like in this top picture, you can see that the endothelial cell actually is punched all the way through with pores. So there's little holes or pores in the uh, endothelium. And so another word for a pore is a fenestration, and that is why these are called fenestrated capillaries. So they have these little pores. And the pores allow for very rapid exchange of water and solutes. They're still too small for red blood cells or plasma proteins to pl pass through, but they can allow the very rapid exchange of other types of solutes as well as water. You can find fenestrated capillaries in the choroid plexus of the brain, and we talked about this last semester. This is the structure that makes the cerebrospinal fluid. You can find fenestrated capillaries in endocrine organs, and we covered that in Chapter 18, and now it should make sense why you would find these types of capillaries there, because these are structures that are releasing hormones into the blood. So by having fenestrated capillaries with pores, these organs are able to get their hormones into the blood more quickly. And then you can also find fenestrated capillaries in the digestive system and the kidneys, and we're going to see how they work in those systems in upcoming chapters. 
Now there is a special type of fenestrated capillary called a sinusoidal capillary and that's shown down here at the bottom right and these guys have very irregular shapes and again remember that the sinusoids are related to fenestrated capillaries because you do have the pores in the endothelial cells so if you look at these endothelial cells you can still see all the little fenestrations or pores but what makes these guys a little different is that they also have gaps between cells so it is a discontinuous endothelium and it's also a thinner basement membrane and in some places no basement membrane at all. So you actually have these really large gaps between cells and that is what uh, is a key characteristic of a sinusoid. So in these gaps, large items can cross like blood cells and plasma proteins and you find sinusoidal capillaries in the liver, the bone marrow, the spleen, and some of the endocrine organs. And in the liver, spleen, and bone marrow, this is where those phagocytic cells like the macrophages sit and they monitor the passing blood and when they see an old or damaged red blood cell, they engulf it and recycle it. They also will uh, take pathogens and debris out of passing blood. So we talked about a lot of that in uh, chapter 19 when we talked about the turnover and recycling of old red blood cells. Now you have a little bit of uh, the rest of the story is that this is actually taking place in the liver, spleen, and bone marrow where you have these sinusoidal capillaries. So a capillary bed is an interconnected network of capillaries. And so you have a bunch of capillaries in an area that are all uh, connected to each other as well as to an arterial and a venule. And some terminology related to capillary beds, sometimes you can have multiple arteries or arterioles that can supply blood to one capillary bed and these are called collaterals. So up here on the upper uh, left you can see the collateral arteries. This is two arteries bringing blood to this one capillary bed shown in this picture. And some terminology to know, if you see the word anastomosis, that is a description of two blood vessels that come together and join up. So up here, where these two collateral arteries come together, that is called an arterial anastomosis because you have two collateral arteries fusing so that they are both delivering their blood to this one capillary bed. You can also have an arteriovenous anastomosis or if you look at the name, we are connecting an artery and a vein. So this is a direct link between an arteriole and a venule, and it allows blood to completely bypass the capillary bed. And control of the arteriovenous anastomosis is usually um, controlled by the autonomic nervous systems. So you also have precapillary sphincters in a capillary bed. And these are little contractile smooth muscle cells that surround the entrance to a capillary. So if I go back for a moment, they have a close-up uh, view here of a precapillary sphincter. So you can see that there are smooth muscle cells that surround the opening to a capillary. And so when those smooth muscle cells constrict, it will block flow into that capillary. So at the top here shows uh, sphincters relaxed. At the bottom it shows sphincters contracted and so now blood is passing straight through and it's not going into this network of capillaries. So a thoroughfare channel is this middle central channel here that allows blood to pass th straight through the center of a capillary bed. And so it allows a passageway for the blood in the event that all of the precapillary sphincters are closed and blood cannot flow out into the capillary bed. So vasomotion is the cycling of contraction and relaxation of these sphincters that can change blood flow through the capillary beds. And this is important for autoregulation or when your body wants to control blood flow to go to one area over another. So for example, uh, during thermoregulation, we know that we have reduced blood flow to our skin. This is why uh, your, your hands get cold when you're cold because your body is trying to keep more of the blood into the trunk where your vital organs are. And so this would be an example of where uh, blood flow is being reduced to the capillaries in your extremities. And the precapillary sphincters can also contract and relax just normally about 12 times per minute, which can change uh, the blood flow through various capillary beds. So blood can go to 
capillary bed A at one moment and then it can go to capillary B at the next moment and this allows your blood to cycle through your different capillary beds. And this is important because you only have enough blood to flow through about 25% of your capillary beds at one given moment. So you don't have enough blood to fill all of your capillary beds at the same time. So having these precapillary sphincters and having this vasomotion allows your blood to cycle through the different capillary beds so that all of your body cells can eventually have access to the blood. They just have to wait their turn. Angiogenesis is the formation of new blood vessels from pre-existing vessels, and this is controlled by a chemical called vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF. Angiogenesis occurs most rapidly during embryonic and fetal development, so as you're developing um, in the womb, you're actually developing new blood vessels for the new body parts that you're essentially growing. It will, of course, also uh, continue during childhood development as you grow and get larger as you become an adult. It also occurs as you gain adipose tissue. So if you are gaining a lot of weight, uh, you're eating a lot of extra food, and you're making more adipose tissue to store your extra fat reserves, that those adipose cells are also going to need a blood supply. So you will have uh, angiogenesis to grow out new blood vessels to your increased amount of adipose tissue. And this is also a focus of cancer research because uh, tumors can also trigger angiogenesis. So when a tumor reaches a certain stage, it actually starts secreting VEGF which causes blood vessels to grow toward the tumor. And then once a tumor is uh, nice and uh, has this nice blood supply to it, it can grow much larger. And this is when you start having the danger of metastasis where the tumor cells enter the blood vessels and travel to other areas of the body. So angiogenesis in uh, cancer is also a big topic of research. In this section, we're going to talk about veins, and we'll talk about the three types of veins, the valves we find in veins, and then some venous issues such as hemorrhoids, varicose veins, and deep vein thrombosis. So we can categorize veins into three categories, and these categories are more based on size rather than differences in the amount of like muscle versus elastic tissue like we did with the arteries. With the veins, the first two divisions are mainly based on size. So we have the very large veins, and these are going to be like your superior vena cava and your inferior vena cava and their largest branches. And these large veins are shown at the top here. They have a very thick tunica externa and a relatively thin tunica media. Then we have medium-sized veins, which are comparable in size to those muscular arteries we looked at. They also have a thick tunica externa and a thin tunica media. Then the ones that are the most different are going to be your venules, and your venules collect blood from the capillary beds um, to start it on its journey back to the heart. And the smallest venues have no tunica media at all, so they just have a tunica externa surrounding an endothelium. Pressures in the venous system are much lower than they are in the arterial system, and we'll look at pressures in more detail in an upcoming section. But I'm mentioning it now because it explains why veins need valves. So the veins in our limbs, so our arms and legs, have valves inside of them. And the valves are actually folds of the tunica intima, and the folds point in the direction of blood flow. So these are some valves shown in the leg here. And so blood flow would be upwards toward the heart. And so the, vol the uh, fol valve folds fold inward and point upward, which is in the direction of the blood flow. So the venous blood pressure is not enough to counteract the force of gravity. So without these valves, the blood would just pool in the veins in our legs and it wouldn't return back up to our heart. And so the valves are there to prevent the backflow of blood and to allow the blood to continuously move toward the heart without falling backward from the force of gravity. So here's a picture that shows, so the blood will flow to the heart, and when you move around and your muscles contract, that will push the blood upwards, and then the valves will close to prevent backward flow of the blood. 
And so contraction of the muscles in your limbs does help to squeeze the blood toward the heart and can help improve venous return. This is one reason why uh, exercise and things like walking are good for you because it helps to increase that venous return and long periods of sitting will actually work against you because you won't have as much muscle contraction to help push that venous blood back to the heart. If the vein walls near a valve weaken or become stretched, the valves may not work properly. And this can lead to varicose veins, which are twisted enlarged veins, which usually occur in the legs. So here's an example. So here again, we have our healthy vein with healthy valves and the blood will flow upward and then the valve will prevent it from flowing back. But with the varicose vein, the um, vein gets all stretched and twisted and the valves are no longer working very well. So the blood pools back in the veins and that is what stretches them out and enlarges them. Varicose veins are the most common in people who stand for long periods of time. And superficial ones, like the ones that you can see from the surface, are mostly a cosmetic issue. So people usually only have those treated because they don't like the look of them. However, variscosity of a deep leg vein can actually pose a threat. So a deep vein thrombosis, or a DVT, is a clot, which is called a thrombus, which occurs because of the sluggish movement of venous blood. So you can imagine that if the blood is not getting its way back up to the heart and it's just sitting there in the veins, as it sits, it has an increased opportunity to clot. And once you have a clot form, this not only can impair the venous return, it can ultimately result in a pulmonary embolism. So with a pulmonary embolism, if you think about your blood flow from the last chapter, blood coming back from the body is going to come up, and from the legs, it'll come up through the inferior vena cava, and it'll come into the right atrium of the heart, then goes to the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, it's going to go out through the pulmonary trunk and to the pulmonary arteries. So the first place a clot that shakes free from a vein in the leg is going to land is in the lungs. And that is what we call a pulmonary embolism. Another vein valve issue is a hemorrhoid. So a hemorrhoid occurs when the veins in and around the anus become swollen and irritated. These can be internal or external. So in this picture here, we have a normal venous plexus here at the bottom left and a normal one at the top right. And then the top left shows one that has become a hemorrhoid. So the blood has gotten uh, backed up and is swelling those veins in that area due to a defect in the valves. And you can also have external hemorrhoids uh, that are closer to the um, outer surface of the anus. And again, it's the same thing. The valves are, are damaged and not working properly and the blood backs up into this venous system. So hemorrhoid risk will increase with long periods of sitting on the toilet or straining during a bowel movement. So the straining actually pushes the blood back down against the valves and that can stretch the veins out. So with time and with a diet that helps loosen your stools, hemorrhoids can clear up on their own and an increased fiber in the diet can help prevent them, but surgical options do exist for both hemorrhoids and varicose veins. So let's look at the distribution of the blood through the entire circulatory system. So the majority of your blood is actually in your systemic circuit veins at any given moment. So if you look at this pie graph here, you can see that 64% of your blood at any given moment is in your systemic venous system. So only 9% is going to be in the pulmonary circuit, 7% is going to be in the heart, 13% will be in your systemic arteries, and then 7% will be in your systemic capillaries. So large majority of your blood is in your systemic veins at any given point. And of all of this uh, venous blood, a large portion of it, so one-third of the 64%, which is 21%, is found in your liver, your bone marrow, and your skin. And these are called large venous networks because they do hold a lot of venous blood at any given moment. 
So veins are more distensible, which means they are more expandable than arteries, and veins can expand easily even at low pressures. And this is a uh, characteristic called a high capacitance. So we talked about resistance earlier. Capacitance is the relationship between the volume of blood and blood pressure. So if you're able to expand easily at low pressure, you would have a high capacitance. And veins, since they can do this, are called capacitance vessels. Remember, arterioles are resistance vessels. Veins are capacitance vessels. So because of the high capacitance, veins can accommodate large changes in blood volume. And for this reason, we can think of our systemic venous system as being a blood reservoir. So during a serious hemorrhage, which is a loss of blood, our veins can constrict, which is called venoconstriction. So remember, vasoconstriction we talked about earlier was the constriction of arteries, in particular arterioles. And when you see venoconstriction, you're talking about constriction of veins. And when venoconstriction happens, it takes a large portion of the 64% of your blood in your venous circuit, and it pushes it into the arterial system and to the capillaries to help maintain normal blood volumes to vital organs like your heart and your brain. So now we are going to look at pressure and resistance and the relationship between both of these factors and blood flow. So under normal conditions, blood flow equals cardiac output. We talked about cardiac output in the last chapter when we talked about the heart. And so as cardiac output increases, blood flow to capillaries increases and vice versa. So if cardiac output decreases, blood flow to capillaries would decrease. So now we're going to look at the factors that affect blood flow. And there are two primary factors. The first one is pressure. And pressure and blood flow are directly proportional. That means that as pressure increases, blood flow increases, and as pressure decreases, blood flow decreases. So that's what we mean by saying they are directly proportional. If one goes up or down, the other one goes up or down. So think about how water pressure can affect like your shower. And if you go to a hotel or you're on vacation in a new place and you talk about it having higher or lower water pressure, you'd have more water coming out of the shower, right? So higher pressure means a higher flow, and a low pressure would mean a low flow. So think about how your uh, water pressure in your home also follows this rule. The other factor is resistance, and resistance is inversely proportional to blood flow. So as resistance increases, blood flow decreases, and as resistance decreases, blood flow increases. And this should be easy to remember if you remember that resistance is actually defined as forces that oppose blood flow. So of course, resistance would be opposite to blood flow because it's opposing it. So as resistance increases, blood flow decreases. So total Peripheral resistance is the resistance of the entire cardiovascular system. And again, remember that resistance is inversely proportional to blood flow. So as resistance increases, blood flow decreases. So the total peripheral resistance is made up of three separate factors. The first one is vascular resistance. And this is the forces that oppose blood flow inside blood vessels. And this is the largest contributor to the overall resistance. And vascular resistance is due to the friction of the blood up against the vessel walls. And the amount of the friction that you get depends on two factors, the length of the blood vessel and the diameter of the blood vessel. And we're going to look at that in more detail in a moment. The second major factor is blood viscosity. And blood viscosity is resistance to the flow caused by interactions among molecules and suspended materials. So basically how thick the blood is. We talked in chapter 19 about how blood is already thicker than water, but as blood gets thicker, 
it has an increased viscosity and it has a decreased flow. So thicker fluids flow more slowly. So as viscosity increases, you have an increased resistance. And this can be easy to remember if you think about like pouring honey or molasses, right? The thicker something is you're trying to pour, the slower it flows, right? So you have to wait a bit to be able to pour some of that out of a container. Viscosity can change with like dehydration, for example. So if you become dehydrated and you don't have enough water in your body, that will in increase your blood viscosity. And we talked about blood doping in chapter 19, people who will take like erythropoietin, for example, to increase the number of red blood cells. The more red blood cells you add to the blood will also increase its viscosity. So your blood viscosity can change. And if it becomes too high, that's going to increase resistance. And the third factor that affects uh, resistance is turbulence. And turbulence is defined as the eddies and swirls that upset the smooth flow of blood. You normally have turbulence in the heart, especially as the blood moves through the valves, but turbulence in the peripheral blood vessels is not common and not normal. And you only have turbulence in the peripheral blood vessels if the vessel walls are damaged or if you have those atherosclerotic plaques. So here's an example. So if you have a plaque deposit, when the blood then has to force through this area, it's going to cause turbulence, which is the blood flowing in multiple different directions and swirls and whirls and eddies instead of going straight forward. And as turbulence increases, that increases resistance. So now let's look a little bit more at the vascular resistance. So we talked about this was the, the most uh, contributing factor to overall resistance. And vascular resistance is caused by the friction between the blood and the vessel walls. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, vascular resistance is dependent on the vessel length and diameter. So let's look at the length first. A longer vessel means you have more surface area of vessel wall to interact with the blood. So as you increase the length, you have an increase in resistance. So if you look at this first picture up here, so a smaller length, you've got less of the uh, vessel wall to rub up against the blood. So you would have a lower resistance than if you have a longer vessel where you've got more of the vessel wall to have friction with the blood and that would give you a higher resistance. So an increased length is an increase in resistance. Now we don't really have to worry about our vessel length changing on a day-to-day -day basis uh, except when we're growing as a child. So growing from a child up into an adult is about the only time your vessels really change in length. You might have an increase in vessel length if you're gaining a lot of adipose tissue and getting a lot of angiogenesis going on there but otherwise your vessel length is pretty much uh, constant. So the thing that is most likely to change is the vessel diameter. So now let's think about diameter and how that relates to friction. So a larger diameter means less of the vessel wall interacts with the blood. So look at this middle picture. A large diameter, most of the blood is going straight through the middle and it's not gonna be rubbing up against the walls. So as diameter increases, you have a decrease in resistance. And that's shown in the bottom picture. So here, if I have a diameter of two centimeters, I have a resistance of one. And if I narrow that, but just half it, so a diameter of one centimeter, my resistance goes all the way up to 16. And that is because more of the blood is now able to rub up against the walls of the blood vessel. Now diameter can change a lot in our cardiovascular system. So it can change with vasoconstriction and vasodilation. And most of the vascular resistance is going to occur in the arterioles because these are the vessels that can vasoconstrict and vasodilate. And again, this is another reason why these vessels are called the resistance vessels because this is where you're gonna have your highest levels of resistance to blood flow. All right, so now let's look at pressure. And remember, pressure is directly proportional to blood flow. So as pressure increases, blood flow increases. So there are three important pressures in the cardiovascular system. 
There is blood pressure, which is what we generally call blood pressure when we're talking to each other and our family and our friends. And this is actually arterial pressure. So when you say blood pressure, you're really talking about arterial pressure. And blood pressure is given as a systolic and diastolic pressure, so it's two numbers. So for example, your blood pressure may be 120 over 80. That first number is the systolic pressure. The second number is the diastolic pressure. Pressures range from 120 millimeters mercury at the entrance to the aorta to roughly 35 millimeters mercury at the start of a capillary bed. So take home message here is that in the arteries, our pressures can range from 120 millimeters mercury closest to the heart and 35 millimeters mercury further away from the heart. Then we have capillary hydrostatic pressure or CHP. This is the pressure of the blood inside the capillaries. It's usually 35 millimeters mercury at the arterial side, because that's where it's coming in from up here from the arteries. And then it's 18 millimeters mercury at the venule side. So again, the range here is from 35 to 18 millimeters mercury. Then we have our venous pressure, which is the pressure of blood within the venous system, so all of your veins and venules. This starts at 18 millimeters of mercury in a venule just after the blood has left the capillary, and then it drops to about two millimeters of mercury at the right atrium where the superior and inferior vena come into the heart. So our range here is 18 to two millimeters of mercury. So the reason why I'm giving you these ranges is because differences in blood pressure is one thing that keeps your blood moving in one direction, so around the circuit from your heart and then back to your heart. So the gradients are important because blood will flow more easily from a high pressure to a low pressure. So in all of these areas, you'll notice we start off high and then we go to a lower number and that helps with the blood flow. So let's look at some of the graphs you were provided to look at the relationship between pressure, diameter, and velocity. And so we're going to start with the blood pressure, the middle graph here. So notice that pressure is the highest in the arteries. So we're showing the average blood pressure here. So we're not looking at the two numbers. We're just looking at an average. So we start off with the aorta with the highest pressures being around 120 millimeters mercury. And then notice that throughout the entire system, blood pressure steadily drops all the way through to the vena cava, so right before the superior and inferior vena cava come back into the heart, you have your lowest blood pressure. So uh, fluids do want to fl flow from high to low pressure, so think of this as like one big giant slide, and so the fluids want to move in this direction. Also notice that the pressure drop is the largest in the arterioles because this is where you have that increased resistance. Remember that the arterioles are your resistance vessels. Now let's take a look at the velocity of blood flow, so how fast blood is flowing. So the blood flow is normally correlated directly with the pressure. So in the areas where we have higher pressure, like in the arteries, we're going to have a faster blood flow. And then as we get farther away from the heart and the pressure decreases, notice that the blood flow slows way down. So by the time we get to the capillaries, the blood is not flowing very fast. But something interesting happens. You would expect if you were to just look at the pressure, you would expect the blood flow velocity to continue to fall all the way until the blood gets back from the heart. But in fact, it picks up again when it reaches the vein. So why does blood flow velocity increase in the venous system? And to answer that question, we have to look at this last graph that shows the diameter of blood vessels. So remember we talked about the three types of arteries and we said the elastic arteries had the largest diameter. We also talked about the three types of veins and we said those large veins also had the largest diameter. Well, if you remember, we also just said that as diameter increases, you have a reduced res resistance, and as resistance decreases, this is going to increase the flow. So as veins get closer to the heart, you have an increase in diameter. 
that's going to lower resistance and because resistance is lower that's going to increase blood flow and that is why you have this increase of velocity as the blood returns to the heart so now let's talk just a little bit more about the arterial pressure which is what we commonly just call blood pressure and as I mentioned before there are two readings so that first number is the systolic pressure so this is the pressure in the arteries during ventricular systole or when the ventricles are contracting so if we look at this pressure graph this pressure graph is actually showing you the peaks and troughs so the highest points up here would be the systolic pressures this would be while the heart is actually contracting or the ventricles and then diastolic pressure is during ventricular diastole when the ventricles are relaxing and so these would be the troughs or the lowest points here so when we say our normal blood pressure is 120 over 80 we are saying that the systolic pressure is 120 and we are saying that the diastolic pressure is 80 so pulse pressure is actually the difference between the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure and the pulse pressure is used to calculate a mean arterial pressure which is that line that we saw earlier and your textbook gives you the formula and tells you how to calculate it but I'm not going to go that deep so I'm not going to give you the formula and I'm not going to ask you to calculate it but you do use the pulse pressure to calculate the mean arterial pressure so normal blood pressure is considered to be 120 over 80 so that's a 120 systolic pressure and an 80 diastolic pressure hypertension is defined as abnormally high blood pressure this is the most common of all the blood pressure problems would be hypertension if your systolic number is between 120 and 139 or your diastolic number is between 80 and 89 that is called prehypertension and your doctor will probably start telling you to uh, take measures to try to control your blood pressure if your systolic number goes up to 140 to 159 and your diastolic number goes up to 90 to 99 that is stage 1 hypertension and at that point you're going to have to start probably being treated for high blood pressure and then of course if the numbers go even higher then you get into uh, other stages of hypertension hypotension is abnormally low blood pressure and this is usually only a problem if someone has a significant blood loss or if they're taking medications for hypertension and it pushes them too far in the other direction and hypertension is bad we've talked about it before um, but it also increases the workload of the heart it can eventually even cause an increase in the uh, left ventricle heart muscle to to enlarge and it also stresses the walls of the vessels as we mentioned earlier and can put you at a higher risk for developing atherosclerotic plaques and aneurysms and the last thing I want to point out before we leave this slide is that notice that by the time the blood reaches the capillaries there are no pressure fluctuations so the further away you get from the heart the less you have these fluctuations in a systolic and a diastolic pressure and that is due to the elastic rebound of those elastic arteries that we talked about those help to modulate the pressure changes so that eventually the pressure changes are completely gone so by the time the blood flows into the capillaries you have a constant pressure so venous return we talked about in chapter 20 when we talked about the heart the venous return is the amount of blood arriving at the right atrium each minute and it has a direct impact on cardiac output because the blood coming in is the same as the blood you're then pumping out so there are five major things that help with the venous return the first is the pressure gradient so even though venous pressures are low there is still a pressure gradient so you still go from 18 milligrams mercury or it should be millimeters mercury from your venules to 2 millimeters mercury in a large vein and again fluids want to move naturally from high to low pressures so even though pressures are low in the venous system there is still a pressure gradient which is going to help the blood flow toward the heart 
The second thing is that increase in diameter. So as blood gets closer to the heart, the diameter of veins increases. As the diameter increases, you have a reduction in the resistance, which helps to increase blood flow. And we saw that on the graph as well. The larger diameter as you get closer to the heart is going to reduce resistance and increase blood flow, which again will help the blood return to the heart. The next thing that helps with venous return is muscular compression. This is the contraction of skeletal muscle, which compresses nearby veins, and this helps to squeeze the blood toward the heart. So we saw this earlier. If you have uh, veins in your legs, for example, and the muscles in your legs are being worked, so when the muscles contract, that is going to squeeze nearby veins and help to push that blood up toward the uh, heart. Now, when you stand for long periods of time, you're actually unconsciously contracting and relaxing your leg muscles, which help push this blood back toward the heart and keep it from pooling in your legs. But if you stand for long periods of time with your muscles immobilized and your knees locked, you can potentially faint from the blood staying in your legs and not being returned to the heart and then eventually you don't have enough uh, blood getting to your brain and that causes you to lose consciousness which is fainting. And compression socks can help with the venous return by not allowing the blood to pull in the legs so with compression socks you're also adding an extra force to help force that blood upward toward the heart. And then valves help as well. So this is the fourth thing that helps with venous return. The valves prevent the backflow of blood due to the pull of gravity. So between the squeezing of the muscles or compression socks, and that helps push the blood up, and then the valves prevent it from going back down. And then the last thing that helps with venous return is the respiratory pump. This is the mechanism by which intrapleural pressure changes help assist venous return to the heart. So we haven't talked about how you, uh, the respiratory system works. That's in an upcoming chapter. But to give you a preview, when you inhale, so think about taking a deep breath in, your thoracic cavity expands, and this is going to decrease the pressure in the thoracic cavity. And this works as like a vacuum to suck up venous blood um, up the inferior vena cava. So blood in the superior vena cava is actually doesn't really have a problem getting to the heart because it's moving downward and the same as the pool of gravity. So we really are only concerned with getting blood up the inferior vena cava back to the heart. And then when you exhale, this reduces the size of the thoracic cavity and helps to push blood from the inferior vena cava into the right atrium. So if we look at this uh, little picture here, so when you inhale, which is shown on the left, you increase the thoracic cavity, which is shown in green, that's going to compress your abdominal pelvic cavity and it's gonna create a suction with the decreased uh, intrathoracic pressure. And that's going to help pull this blood up the inferior vena cava toward the heart. And then when you exhale, it'll help push it into the right atrium. And so we call that the respiratory pump. And this also helps, so like when you exercise, you breathe uh, uh, deeper and heavier. And so that's also going to help the blood return to your heart during periods of exertion. Now we are going to look at capillary exchange. And again, I'm going to remind you that capillaries are the only vessels where exchange takes place between the blood and the interstitial fluid. And we'll also talk about edema in this section. So here is where all of those processes you learned back in chapter three come into play. So there are three important processes that allow capillary exchange to take place. And the first is diffusion. Diffusion is based on the concentration gradients of solutes. And as a reminder, this was all covered in chapter three of AMP1. Solutes move from high to low concentration. So as a reminder, again from chapter three, diffusion occurs most rapidly when the distances are short, when the concentration gradient is steep, and a steep concentration gradient means a bigger difference between a high concentration and a low concentration. So think of the gradient as being the difference between these two. So the bigger the difference, the steeper the gradient. 
And diffusion also occurs most rapidly when ions or molecules are small. So water, ions, and small organic molecules can diffuse through adjacent endothelial cells or through the pores in the fenestrated capillaries. Ions can diffuse by passing through membrane channels of the endothelial cells. So for example, calcium channels, chloride channels, sodium channels, potassium channels, etc. Lipids and gases can diffuse directly through the plasma membrane of endothelial cells. So a, they are able to cross directly over the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane. Now large water-soluble compounds can only cross through the pores of fenestrated capillaries. So again, these are going to be located in places like the endocrine organ where you're putting hormones into the blood. And plasma proteins, which are the largest things other than, than the blood cells themselves, can only cross at sinusoids. And remember, sinusoids are in the liver where the plasma proteins are made. So the next important process for capillary exchange is filtration. And filtration is driven by hydrostatic pressure, which is the fluid pressure of the blood up against the walls of the vessel so you can think of this as blood pressure. Water is going to move from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure, and it pushes, small, it pushes water and small solutes across the capillary walls. So let's take a look at this picture. So we have our capillary hydrostatic pressure, so that is the blood pressure within the capillary, and it will push water and anything small enough to fit through these gaps between cells out into the interstitial fluid. In fenestrated capillaries, it would also push stuff through the pores, but in a continuous capillary, it'll just push stuff between uh, the small spaces between endothelial cells. So this will include things like water, things like very small solutes, things like glucose. Things that are going to get left behind inside the capillary are like red blood cells and these large uh, plasma proteins that we covered in chapter 19, like the albumin and the globulins. So large solutes and proteins are left behind in the bloodstream. And filtration is going to take place at the arterial end of the capillary bed. And then the last process is reabsorption. Reabsorption is driven by osmotic pressure. And again, quick little review from AMP1 where we covered osmosis in Chapter 3. With osmosis, water is moving from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. So water moves toward the hypertonic or higher solute area. Reabsorption will bring water back into the vessels. And the plasma proteins that get left behind that can't be filtered out create a high osmotic pressure inside the capillary, and we call this blood colloid osmotic pressure, or BCOP, and this is the driving force for the osmosis that is going to bring the water back into the capillary. And this takes place at the venous ends of the capillary bed. All right, so let's look at this picture of capillary exchange, and I know it can look a little daunting when you first look at it, but let's break it down. Let's start by looking at the blood pressure, which is shown in these little red arrows. So notice that the hydrostatic pressure or blood pressure starts at 35 millimeters mercury on the arterial side of the capillary, and it's going to drop all the way to 18 millimeters mercury on the venule side. So we covered that before. That is the pressure gradient within capillaries from 35 to 18 millimeters mercury. The second thing I want you to notice is the blood colloid osmotic pressure. And again, this is uh, created by all of those plasma proteins, the uh, albumins and the globulins that are inside the blood. And the blood colloid osmotic pressure stays constant because those proteins cannot cross the capillary walls. So the uh, blood colloid osmotic pressure is shown by these yellow arrow arrows. So notice that it stays constant at 25 millimeters mercury all the way across. So at the arterial end of the capillary, 
the hydrostatic pressure is going to exceed the osmotic pressure. That means the force pushing water out is greater than the force bringing water back in. So we have net filtration is going to occur on this side. That means we're going to have water and small solutes moving from the blood out into the tissues. All right, now let's look at the venule end of the capillary. Notice that now my osmotic pressure is higher than my hydrostatic pressure. So I've got 25 millimeters mercury coming in, 18 millimeters mercury going out. So I have more water coming in than is going out. So reabsorption is occurring on this end. So I have a net movement of water and some small solutes coming back into the capillary. Also notice that the average filtration per day is 24 liters per day over here on the arterial end and the reabsorption is an average of 20.4 liters per day. So also notice that more fluid is filtered out than is reabsorbed. So here is another picture. Um, I like to draw these little lines. It kind of helps me visualize it. So with this picture, we've got, again, our arterial end, our venule end, and our capillary in between. And so the line is showing the blood pressure in red. So we start at 35 and we drop to 18. The blue line is showing the osmotic pressure, which holds steady at 25 millimeters mercury. So when the red line is above the blue line, you've got a net movement of water out of the capillary. And so on the arterial side, that would be filtration. When the red line is below the blue line, you have a net flow of water into the capillary. That would be reabsorption, and that is on the venule end. And so again, we have that excess fluid, so more fluid is filtered out than is reabsorbed. So we do have this extra fluid. And the extra fluid, which is about 3.6 liters per day, actually makes its way into nearby lymphatic vessels. And this fluid is eventually going to make its way back to the bloodstream, but first it's going to pass through the lymphatic system, and we're covering that in the next chapter, chapter 22. But I will go ahead and introduce edema here. Edema is an abnormal accumulation of interstitial fluid. So if you have too much fluid gets released into the tissues more than the lymphatic system can handle, you'll have swelling from that fluid, which is edema. So edema can be caused by increased blood pressure. So imagine if I took this red line and I raised it up over here. So I made it a higher on this side. I would have a lot more fluid going out. So that would be more fluid going out than is being reabsorbed, and it would be too much for the lymphatic vessels to handle. So increased blood pressure can cause edema. Or I can also decrease the blood colloid osmotic pressure or decrease the amount of plasma proteins, and then that would lower this blue line. And again, if you imagine lowering the blue line, you're going to have, again, a lot more fluids going out over here than you're going to be reabsorbing over here. So let's take a closer look at edema. And I put my little uh, graph up here. So here is what is the normal condition. Blood pressure falls from 35 to 18. Osmotic pressure normally stays steady at 25. So on the arterial side, my, pre my blood pressure is higher than osmotic pressure and water is leaving the capillary. And then on the venule side, osmotic pressure is higher than blood pressure and water is going back into the capillary. So let's look at why you get swelling from an injury. Like if you get a bruise or you get a bump or some kind of injury, you have swelling in that area. So when you injure your tissues, capillaries in that area can rupture. And when the capillaries rupture, the blood plasma proteins are actually able to leave the bloodstream and go into the tissues. And that is going to lower this blue line, right? So that's going to decrease the blood colloid pressure and that will produce local edema. And here's what that looks like. So like if I took this blue line and I just brought it from 25 millimeters mercury down to 20 millimeters mercury, look at the big difference in fluid going out 
versus fluid being reabsorbed. Right now I've got a whole lot more fluid leaving my capillary than I'm reabsorbing at the other side. So that produces a local swelling or a local edema. In starvation, the liver can't make enough plasma proteins because you're not eating enough to get the nutrients to make those plasma proteins. So again, it's a case of lowering the blood colloid pressure so it would look very similar to this graph here, except it's widespread. When it's an injury, it's just local. With starvation, it's widespread. And typically, like when you see the starving children, they have the really large stomach. That stomach is actually edema uh, fluid that is collecting in the per peritoneal cavity, and that is called ascites. Now let's take a look at high blood pressure. So if we have elevation of the capillary hydrostatic pressure, which is the blood pressure inside the capillary, now we take this red line and we raise it up. And so if we're raising the blood pressure, again, we're having a lot more fluid leave the capillary than is being reabsorbed on the venule end. So you'll notice that in both of these cases, the take home message is that in all cases of edema, more fluid is leaving the capillaries than is reabsorbed. And it's also too much for the lymphatic system to drain. And so that results in swelling. So the term bulk flow is the term we use to describe the net movement of water out of the capillaries through the tissues and then eventually back to the bloodstream by way of the lymphatic system. And again, we're covering the lymphatic system in the next chapter, but I'm introducing it here. So we've already talked about a circuit where your heart pumps blood out to the arteries. The arteries get smaller and smaller, eventually you get to capillaries, and then venules pick up the blood, then you go back through different veins all the way back to the heart. Well, you have that excess fluid that is coming out at all of your capillaries, so you're always filtering out more than you reabsorb, and that extra fluid becomes lymph, and it enters lymphatic vessels, and then travels through the lymphatic system, and is eventually dumped back into a vein. So it is going to go back into your bloodstream, it just takes a detour. So you can kind of think of this as like a little detour for some of the fluid that makes up your blood. And again, we're gonna go into more detail in the next chapter, but for this chapter, we're just giving you uh, the purpose of having this system, which is called bulk flow. It helps with constant communication and exchange between the plasma and interstitial fluid, which are two major components of the extracellular fluid. It also helps with the distribution of nutrients, hormones, and gases throughout all of your tissues. It assists in the transport of insoluble lipids and proteins that cannot cross capillary walls. So very large things that can't cross a capillary wall can get picked up by the lymphatic system and dumped into the blood that way and it flushes bacterial toxins and other chemicals to your lymphatic system to be handled by the immune system. So as we're gonna see in chapter 22, along the way through your lymphatic system, you've got a lot of immune cells that are monitoring what is passing by. Now we're gonna look at the regulation of blood flow and I'm gonna divide this over a couple of sections. So in this section, we'll get an overview and then look specifically at autoregulation. So tissue perfusion is the clinical term for blood flow through the tissues. And so the cardiovascular system regulates multiple things to make sure that tissue perfusion is adequate. And these are the cardiac output, and we talked a lot about regulating cardiac output in the last chapter, chapter 20. The peripheral resistance can also be regulated, and this is done through vasoconstriction and vasodilation and then we can also regulate blood pressure. So the goals of this regulation is to make sure that changes occur at an appropriate time, that the changes occur in the right area of the body, and that the changes occur without drastically changing blood pressure and blood flow to our most vital organs. And there are three levels of regulation. There is auto-regulation, which takes place at the local level. We're gonna cover that now. And then there is also neural control and then hormonal control, which we're gonna look at in subsequent sections. So here is an overview of the cardiovascular regulation. 
So we're looking at homeostasis, which would be our normal blood volume and blood pressure. And so autoregulation is going to try to restore homeostasis first. So if something disrupts the homeostasis, and this could be a chemical change like decreased oxygen or pH, increased CO2 or inflammatory molecules, increased tissue activity like you're exercising, or uh, physical stress like trauma or a high local temperature, anything that disturbs the homeostasis, you're going to have inadequate local blood flow and blood pressure. So this is going to cause autoregulation, which are local changes to local capillary beds. And this means changing up the precapillary sphincters in the area that is affected. Now, if this can restore homeostasis by returning the blood flow and pressure to normal, then all is good and we never have to go past this autoregulation stage. However, if the autoregulation is not enough to restore homeostasis, then we are going to kick in with our endocrine mechanisms and our neural mechanisms, and we're going into more detail um, in the next sections with those. And as a reminder, the neural responses are going to be more short-term, so the short-term changes in blood pressure, and the endocrine responses are going to be more long-term changes in blood volume and blood pressure. And so we went over the differences between the nervous system and the endocrine system back in Chapter 18. So now let's just look at the autoregulation, and then we'll look at the neural and endocrine. So again, with autoregulation, this is a localized change, and so we're just changing blood flow through a single capillary bed in an area that is affected. And we can do this by constricting or dilating those precapillary sphincters to allow blood flow into that specific capillary bed. So local vasodilators would be factors that promote dilation of the precapillary sphincters. That's going to allow blood to come into the capillary. So these are going to be conditions when you want extra blood flow in that area. So for example, if you have low oxygen or high CO2, that's an indicator that that tissue is in need of some fresh oxygen and to get rid of its waste. Lactic acid would be an indicator that your muscles have switched to anaerobic respiration because they don't have enough oxygen. So again, that's a signal that we need some more uh, oxygen, so we need some more blood to this area. Nitric oxide is also a local vasodilator. So is increased uh, potassium or hydrogen ion concentration. Inflammatory chemicals like histamine can also promote dilation of the precapillary sphincters. And then an elevated local temperature can do this as well. So here is just an example. And don't get hung up on the details in this picture. I just want to show you. If you have a branch where the red blood cells are, you know, having low oxygen saturation, so most of the oxygen has been removed from this area, so now these tissues need oxygen, they will release chemicals, and in this example, their uh, nitric oxide is involved. This will cause vasodilation of the uh, vessels that are serving that capillary in that region, and so that vessel will widen, which will allow more of the oxygen uh, enriched red blood cells to come to that area. So that's just to give you an idea of what uh, autoregulation or a localized change looks like. Then there are also local vasoconstrictors, which promote constriction of precapillary sphincters. And this is primarily going to be during that vascular spasm phase of hemostasis. So you have prostaglandins and thromboxanes, which are both released by activated platelets, and endothelins, which are released by damaged vessel walls. And so all of these are signs of injury, and so you want to constrict blood flow to that area to reduce blood loss. So now we're going to look at the first part of the central regulation, which is the neural mechanisms, and we're going to cover the baroreceptor reflex and the chemoreceptor reflex. So the cardiovascular center is the area of the medulla oblongata that regulates most cardiovascular functions. And in the cardiovascular center, you have cardiac centers, which control cardiac output. And we talked about these in the last chapter. The cardioacceleratory center will increase cardiac output and is driven by the sympathetic nervous system. 
and the cardio inhibitory center will decrease cardiac output and is driven by the parasympathetic nervous system. You also have a vasomotor center which controls vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So this center can trigger widespread vasoconstriction of arterioles all over the body and it can also trigger vasodilation in skeletal muscles in the brain. An extreme stimulation of the vasomotor center, like say for example if you've lost a lot of blood, will trigger venoconstriction, which is constriction of veins, and this will help to mobilize that venous reserve as we discussed earlier. So vasomotor tone was also introduced in AMP1 when we talked about the autonomic nervous system. This is the normal background level of vasoconstriction in the arteries and it allows for rapid changes in both directions. So at resting normal levels, the sympathetic nervous system will keep these artery walls partially contracted. So in the normal state, they are partially contracted, and this way they can very quickly go in either direction. They can very quickly relax to become vasodilated, or they can be um, stimulated additionally to cause vasoconstriction. And because changes in resistance can have a large impact on the blood pressure, the vasomotor center can effectively control arterial blood pressure by changing the diameter of the vessels, so through vasodilation and vasoconstriction. Now let's look at two important reflexes, and the first one is the baroreceptor reflexes. These adjust cardiac output and peripheral resistance to maintain normal arterial blood pressure. So you have baroreceptors in certain blood vessels that measure the degree of stretch in the vessel walls. And we talked about baro baroreceptors in chapter 15. So in your carotid sinuses, which are at the base of the internal carotid arteries, and this is going to ensure that you have adequate blood flow to the brain. And you also have baroreceptors in your aortic arch which triggers the aortic reflex to ensure adequate blood flow and blood pressure in the systemic circuit. You also have baroreceptors in the wall of the right atrium of the heart, and stretch of these receptors results in the Bainbridge reflex, which was covered in Chapter 20. So when baroreceptor activity increases, and this would happen when you have an increase in blood pressure, the cardio inhibitory center is going to decrease cardiac output, so like for example it could lower the heart rate, and the vasomotor center will trigger vasodilation. Both of these things should lower blood pressure to counteract the increase that triggered the baroreceptors. Conversely, when baroreceptor activity decreases, and this can happen with a decrease in blood pressure, the cardio acceleratory center will increase the cardiac output and the vasomotor center will trigger vasoconstriction. These two things should help to increase the blood pressure, which will counteract the decrease in pressure that triggered the receptors. So here is the homeostasis chart from your textbook. So we have our normal range of blood pressure. So again, if our stimulus is an increase in blood pressure, so an increase in blood pressure will stimulate baroreceptors in the aortic and carotid sinuses. So baroreceptors will be stimulated. So in the medulla oblongata, in your cardiovascular center, you're going to stimulate those cardio inhibitory centers to decrease cardiac output. You're going to inhibit the vasomotor center to cause vasodilation. So decreased cardiac output and vasodilation results in reduced blood pressure, which restores homeostasis back to normal. And then on the other side, if our blood pressure drops, so a decrease in blood pressure will inhibit baroreceptors. So the baroreceptors in the carotid and aortic sinuses become inhibited. That's going to tell the medulla oblongata to stimulate the vasomotor center to result in vasoconstriction and to stimulate the cardio acceleratory center to result in increased output, and these two things will increase the blood pressure back to the normal homeostatic range. The baroreceptor reflex can be triggered when you stand up from a sitting position 
because when you suddenly stand up, especially if you stand up quickly, gravity pulls blood down in your body and away from your head, and that will reduce the uh, signaling in the baroreceptors in the carotid sinuses and will elevate your heart rate and cause vasoconstriction to restore your blood pressure back to normal. So the chemoreceptor reflexes respond to changes in carbon dioxide, oxygen, or pH levels in either the blood or the cerebrospinal fluid. So you have chemoreceptors in your carotid bodies and your aortic bodies, which monitor arterial blood. And chemoreceptors are also located in the medulla oblongata, which monitor CSF or cerebrospinal fluid. So the reflex is stimulated by an increase in carbon dioxide a decrease in pH, which accompanies an increase in carbon dioxide, as we'll see later in the semester, or a decrease in oxygen. So with the normal chemoreceptor reflex, the cardioaccelatory center will increase cardiac output. So again, look at what our stimulus is. Our stimulus is that we have a decrease in oxygen or an increase in CO2. So this is saying we need to get more blood out to the periphery to get rid of the waste product and to bring fresh oxygen. So that is why we are increasing cardiac output. We're also going to have the vasomotor center trigger widespread vasoconstriction. Again, this is going to help increase blood pressure and uh, blood flow and get uh, blood out to the extremities more quickly. And an increase in breathing rate will help to add oxygen to the blood. Now, if the medulla oblongata senses a very large increase in carbon dioxide concentration in the cerebrospinal fluid, it actually goes a step further. It will vasodilate cerebral vessels while having vasoconstriction in most other organs. So that is actually going to lower blood flow to most of your other organs and increase blood flow to the brain. And this is ensuring that the brain gets enough oxygen, even at the expense of other organs, because once your brain goes, the whole body goes. So here is a picture of the chemoreceptor reflexes. So again, our homeostasis is our normal pH, O2, and CO2 levels. And so if any of these, uh, the CO2 level rises or the pH or oxygen levels decrease, that's going to stimulate chemoreceptors in the carotid and aortic bodies and the medulla oblongata. And then we're going to get an increase in respiratory rate. The cardioaccelatory center will increase cardiac output and blood pressure. Vasomotor centers will increase vasoconstriction. And all of this is to help increase blood flow and get more oxygen into the blood, which will increase pH O2 levels and decrease CO2 levels. So that is neural regulation of the cardiovascular system. And in our last section on the regulation, we're going to look at the central regulation, but we're going to look at endocrine mechanisms. In particular, five hormones that regulate cardiovascular function. So there are four hormones that increase blood pressure and volume, and one hormone that decreases blood pressure and volume. So we're first going to look at the ones that increase blood pressure and volume, starting with norepinephrine and epinephrine. So these are released as part of your fight or flight sympathetic response, and they're released from the adrenal medulla gland. They will increase cardiac output and cause widespread peripheral vasoconstriction. The next hormone is antidiuretic hormone, or ADH which is released from the posterior pituitary gland. This hormone is released in response to a decreased blood volume, and it will also be released if it senses that there is angiotensin II in circulation. We'll talk about that hormone in a minute. Antidiuretic hormone will cause vasoconstriction to elevate blood pressure, and then it will also stimulate the kidneys to conserve water, and we'll cover that mechanism when we get to the urinary system in Chapter 26. So remember that an increase in cardiac output, like is shown up here with norepinephrine and epinephrine, and peripheral vasoconstriction, which is shown by both of these two hormones, is going to cause an increase in blood pressure. And so we're counteracting a decrease in blood pressure by releasing these hormones. The third hormone is angiotensin II, 
angiotensin II is released in response to a fall in blood pressure to the kidneys, which is renal blood pressure. And the kidneys don't actually release this particular hormone. Instead, the kidneys release a hormone called renin. And then renin is an enzyme that converts one of the plasma proteins made by the liver called angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. So you have angiotensinogen floating around in your plasma all the time, but it stays in this inactive form until your kidney releases renin, and then renin is going to activate the angiotensinogen to become angiotensin 1. And then there is an enzyme in the lungs called angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE, which is going to convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. So that brings us to our hormone here, angiotensin 2. And what it actually does is it stimulates the adrenal production of aldosterone, which is going to promote sodium retention. It's going to stimulate the secretion of antidiuretic hormone to promote water retention. And it's going to stimulate your thirst to increase fluid intake. So a big part of what angiotensin 2 does is to increase your blood volume by making you hold on to fluid you already have and making you thirsty so you drink more fluid. It will also stimulate increased cardiac output and stimulate peripheral vasoconstriction to help increase your blood pressure as well. The fourth hormone is erythropoietin, which we talked about in Chapter 19. This is released by the kidneys if the blood pressure falls or the oxygen levels are low. And erythropoietin stimulates vasoconstriction, again to help increase blood pressure, but erythropoietin will also increase red blood cell production and maturation to improve the oxygen capacity of the blood. And then we have one set of hormones that will decrease blood pressure and volume, and they are your natriuretic peptides. So there is an atrial natriuretic peptide, or ANP, which is secreted by cardiac muscle cells in the right atrium. So this hormone is only secreted if you have excessive stretching in the right atrium during diastole. So basically that means your blood volume is really high um, or your blood pressure is really high. So you have extra blood in that chamber when it should be relaxing. And that is going to trigger the release of ANP. Brain natriuretic peptide is secreted by ventricle muscle cells in response to excessive stretching during diastole. So atrial natriuretic peptide, or AMP, is when you have stretching of the atrium. BNP is when you get stretching of the ventricles. Yeah, I know it's confusing that they called it brain natriuretic peptide, but that's because it was originally identified when uh, some early anatomist was looking at brain tissue, and so he misidentified what organ was actually producing it. Both A and P and B and P reduce blood volume and blood pressure. They do this by increasing sodium excretion by the kidneys. They promote water loss through an increase in urine production. They reduce your thirst. Again, all of this is going to lower your blood volume. They also block the release of epinephrine, norepinephrine, antidiuretic hormone, and aldosterone. They will stimulate peripheral vasodilation and so all of these are going to lower your blood pressure and blood volume. And as your blood volume and blood pressure decrease, that's going to decrease the stretching of those heart muscles in the atria and the ventricles, which will turn off the release of these two natriuretic peptides. So in conclusion, for the hormones that regulate the cardiovascular system, we have four hormones that will raise our blood pressure and blood volume. And we have one set of hormones, the natriuretic peptides, which will decrease blood pressure and volume. So here is the homeostatic chart. So again, if we start with normal blood pressure and normal uh, volume, if we have an increase in blood pressure, that's going to stretch those cardiac cells in the atria and the ventricles, and you'll get release of ANP and BNP. These are going to act on the kidneys and the blood vessels. And again, here's everything they do. Increase sodium loss, increase water loss, reduce thirst, inhibit these other hormones, and va uh, vasodilate your peripheral arteries, all of which will decrease blood pressure and blood volume back to normal. 
On the flip side of the coin, if our homeostasis gets uh, upset because we have a decrease in blood pressure and volume, like say, for example, you're bleeding out or you've lost a lot of blood, this is going to have a short-term effect on the baroreceptors, which will cause sympathetic release of uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine from the adrenal gland. But you'll also get the kidneys, which will, are going to release EPO and renin. And the renin, once it gets converted to angiotensin II, is going to cause the release of ADH and aldosterone. And you're also going to get your thirst stimulated. You're going to get... Uh, increased cardiac output, you're going to get vasoconstriction, and you're going to increase your red blood cell formation with the EPO. All of this is going to raise blood pressure and raise blood volume back to normal. So you may ask, why do we have all of these hormones to help us if our blood pressure and volume drop and only one set of hormones to help us if it rises? Well, we have more mechanisms to raise blood volume and blood pressure to protect us from serious blood loss and to ensure that tissue perfusion remains adequate even in the event that we do lose a lot of blood. And struggles with high blood pressure is actually a relatively modern occurrence and so it's one that we have not evolved to handle effectively and that is why a lot of people struggle with high blood pressure. So now we'll talk about the vascular supply to some special regions which are the brain, the heart, and the lungs. So regions with special treatment, and I put a smiley face because the brain is first, and if you don't already know, I am a neuroscientist. So we talked about the blood-brain barrier back in AMP1, and the blood-brain barrier serves to isolate most of the central nervous system tissue from the general circulation. And the brain itself has a high demand for oxygen and glucose, so about 12% of our cardiac output goes to the brain, even though the brain only accounts for about 2% of our total body weight. So the brain is definitely special. So blood flow to the brain normally holds steady at 750 milliliters per minute. And blood flow to the brain is protected. So the brain is top priority. So uh, blood flow will be diverted to the brain over other organs. Now, regional blood flow within the brain can be variable depending on our specific activities. So depending on what part of the brain you're using at any given moment, the regional blood flow can change, but the overall blood flow stays steady at 750 milliliters per minute. And if you do have a lack of blood flow to the brain, like from a blood clot or a um, aneurysm, that is called a stroke or a cerebrovascular accident, and we covered those last semester as well. The heart also gets special treatment. So coronary blood flow is about 250 milliliters per minute at rest. It does increase with exercise, though. And coronary blood flow will increase any time the cardiac output has to increase. So you want to get extra blood to those cardiac muscle cells because they'll, they're going to have to work harder to increase cardiac output. And the coronary vessels, which bring the blood to the heart muscle cells, will dilate to increase blood flow to the heart, even if you have peripheral vasoconstriction that is telling the arterioles in the rest of your body to constrict. So you can think of your heart in terms of it being a top priority as well. And then let's look at the lungs. So the blood pressure in the pulmonary capillaries is actually lower than the blood pressure in systemic capillaries. So as a review, in your normal systemic capillaries, the capillary blood pressure starts at 35 millimeters mercury on the arterial side and drops to 18 millimeters mercury on the venial side. In the lungs, the capillary pressure averages only 10 millimeters mercury. Now the blood colloid osmotic pressure caused by the plasma proteins remains the same. So if we think about our little graph from before, our osmotic pressure is staying steady but we're dropping the blood pressure line. So what we have in the pulmonary capillaries is we have the reabsorption is exceeding the filtration. So more blood is being, or more fluid is being reabsorbed into the capillary than is being squeezed out through filtration. 
This prevents the fluid buildup in the alveoli, which are the little air sacs of the lungs, because if fluid gets into those areas, that would interfere with the diffusion of the gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, across those membranes. Now, if pressures in the pulmonary capillaries do rise above 25 millimeters mercury, then you can get pulmonary edema, which is going to be fluid buildup within those air sacs of the lungs. Also in the lungs, the local regulation, so the vasodilation and vasoconstriction that happens locally in the autoregulation level is actually opposite to how it works in other tissues. So in the lungs, low oxygen will cause vessels to constrict rather than dilate. So earlier we looked at an example. So if you have like blood tissue that's getting low oxygen, that'll be a signal to cause vasodilation to that area. In the lungs, it's the opposite. Low oxygen would cause vasoconstriction because there's no sense in bringing deoxygenated blood to an area of the lung with no oxygen. So on the left side here, we have a little bit of the lung. These little air sacs are the alveoli of the lungs. So we have our capillaries coming in from the pulmonary artery, which is deoxygenated. The blood is normally oxygenated inside the lungs and then leaves by the pulmonary veins. But if I have an area of the lungs where I'm not getting any oxygen, so if that's a hypoxic area for whatever reason, and we'll talk about the respiratory system in chapter 23, then I'm no need to send blood to that area because there's no oxygen to pick up. So those blood vessels will actually constrict so that the blood ends up going more toward areas that have oxygen available to diffuse into them. So we have a small little section on the cardiovascular response to exercise. And I'll let you read these little comics later, but the Awkward Yeti is a fun website to look at. He, they draw a lot of anatomy-based uh, comics with like the brain and the lungs and the heart, and et cetera. And now that you've had a lot of A&P, you'll probably find them very enjoyable. So now we're gonna look at the cardiovascular response to exercise, and we're gonna start with light exercise. So during light exercise, you get extensive vasodilation. So your arterioles are going to increase in diameter, which will help to increase blood flow to maintain tissue perfusion. Also, your venous return is going to increase. Because you're working out, you've got a lot of skeletal muscle contractions, which are helping to push that venous blood back toward the heart. And your cardiac output will then subsequently rise. This is going to increase blood flow to the heart muscle because the heart itself is working harder, so it's going to need an increased blood flow. Also, it's going to increase blood flow to your skeletal muscles, which are the ones that are actually doing the exercise, and your skin to help release excess body heat from the muscle contractions. Then when you switch over to heavy exercise, the cardiac output gets raised to its maximum levels. The vasomotor center in the medulla oblongata will severely restrict blood flow to non-essential organs. So essentially at this point, the blood is just flowing to the heart, lungs, skin, and skeletal muscle, and to the brain, of course, because it's special. So here is a table that is showing uh, the distribution or the changes in distribution at rest and during light exercise and strenuous exercise. So you can see, and this is showing the blood flow in milliliters per minute. So you can see the blood flow to skeletal muscles will dramatically increase, especially when you get to strenuous exercise. You can see that blood flow to the heart muscle itself will increase. Blood flow to the skin will increase to help you release the heat that you're building up from the exercise. And your total cardiac output will increase dramatically as well. You'll have a decreased blood flow to your kidney decreased blood flow to your abdominal organs, and then decreased blood flow to other areas. And then of course, the brain is the only organ that gets constant blood flow of 750 milliliters per minute, no matter what's going on. So cardiovascular performance can increase with training. So if you look down here at this chart, we're looking at the weight of the heart, stroke volume, heart rate, cardiac output, and blood pressure. The first line is a non-athlete at rest, 
The second line is a non-athlete at their maximum best, so during strenuous exercise. Then the third line is a trained athlete at rest, and the last line is a trained athlete at their maximum. So you can notice that trained athletes have a much larger stroke volume at rest and when they exercise. And a larger stroke volume means that the same amount of blood can be pumped with fewer heartbeats. If you remember from last chapter, cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. So you can see that the athletes have a higher stroke volume, which is going to actually let them have a lower heart rate and they have a higher cardiac output. And training increases the cardiac reserve, which is that difference between the resting and maximum cardiac outputs. We covered that in chapter 20. Other benefits to exercise is it can help to lower your cholesterol levels, particularly the low density lipoprotein version. And this helps to reduce formation of atherosclerotic plaques and coronary artery disease. Unfortunately, if you already have atherosclerotic plaques, exercise does not get rid of them. It just helps them from continuing to form. Now, extreme exercise is taking things a little too far. So things like an ultramarathon, an Ironman triathlon, etc., can actually cause extreme cardiovascular stresses. Um, not only on the heart and the uh, blood vessels, but other body systems like the kidneys. And people who engage in these types of extreme exercises can sometimes die from um, uh, heart failure or cardiac arrest or kidney failure. So now we're going to look at the cardiovascular response to hemorrhaging. So blood loss and shock. So hemorrhaging would be a loss of a lot of blood, so like from an injury. And the short-term effects are to raise the blood pressure, which will improve peripheral blood flow and keep blood moving to your tissues and those vital organs. So in the short term, you're going to have a heart rate that spikes, which is going to help increase the cardiac output. You're also going to get perif peripheral vasoconstriction, which is going to increase the blood pressure. And then you'll have venoconstriction to mobilize those venous reserves that we talked about earlier. Then in the long term, which can take several days, the goal is to remake all of that blood that you lost. So the goal is restoration of a normal blood volume. So you can recall fluids from the interstitial space, spaces, and you do this because when you lost blood, you decreased your blood colloid osmotic pressure because you lost a lot of plasma proteins in the blood that you lost. And so this means that at the capillaries, that reabsorption is now going to exceed filtration, so more fluid is going to come back into the capillaries than is being filtered out. And so that's a way to take some fluids from the interstitial fluid and put it into the blood vessel instead of leaving it in the tissues. And then you're going to have these hormones be released that are going to help you retain fluid. So this is going to be your ADH, your angiotensin II, and your aldosterone. These will help you have an increased thirst and a decreased kidney output of urine, all of which will help you to keep fluids in your body and to add more fluids. And then you'll want to increase the production of red blood cells to make up for all the red blood cells you lost, and you'll do that through erythropoietin. If you fail to compensate to a severe loss of blood, that does lead to what we call shock. And shock can be dangerous because once you have insufficient blood flow to vital organs, that can lead to death. So here is a summary of the uh, cardiovascular response to blood loss. So homeostasis is dis disturbed by blood loss, which is going to decrease blood pressure and volume. So I'm going to have, uh, in the short term, I'm going to have the nervous system detect the loss of blood and blood pressure with the baroreceptors and chemoreceptors, and I'm going to get activation of the sympathetic nervous system and epinephrine and norepinephrine. And then the endocrine system is also going to have the kidneys release the EPO and then that whole pathway of releasing ADH, angiotensin II, and aldosterone. So I am going to have peripheral vasoconstriction, mobilization of venous blood reserves, increased cardiac output, 
increase red blood cell formation, increase in blood volume, all of which will help to increase my blood volume and increase my blood pressure. And this should sound very similar because this is very similar to the response in the four hormones that we discussed earlier in the endocrine regulation section. So a couple of definitions. Hypovolemic shock is caused by the loss of 15% or more of your body's blood or fluid supply. So this could be either by trauma or injury. This could also happen by dehydration or very severe diarrhea and any other condition that causes fluid loss like uh, serious burns where you lose your uh, cutaneous membrane of your skin and that allows the fluid in your body to just evaporate. And then when you hear hemorrhagic shock, that is a shock that is caused by a significant blood loss either from internal or external bleeding. So a hemorrhagic shock is a specific type of hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic actually means low volume. So this is low volume due to any number of causes. And then if you say hemorrhagic shock, it's low volume due specifically to bleeding. Any of these types of shock can lead to death without treatment. And treatment includes controlling fluid and blood loss first and foremost then trying to replace the lost fluid and blood, stabilizing any damage that is causing fluid and blood loss, and then finally treating the illness or injury that is responsible. And then this is our last section, and you may notice that the rest of the chapter goes into a lot of detail on the names and locations of all of the major arteries and veins in the body. And I am not going to go over that because we've already covered quite a bit in this chapter, and you're going to cover that in your laboratory course. So learning all of those veins and arteries is actually part of your lab. So in this last little section here, I'm just going to give a special mention to two of the things mentioned in the rest of your chapter, and that is the hepatic portal system and the fetal cardiovascular system. So we mentioned before what a portal system was, that a portal system is when you have two separate capillary networks that are joined by a portal vessel. And we looked at one in chapter 18 when we looked at the hypophyseal portal system that is between the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. Now we're going to look at the one in the digestive system. So the digestive system has a portal system so that the substances absorbed in your intestines can be monitored by the liver and either stored, converted, or excreted. So blood flow goes to the organs of the intestines through the superior and inferior mesenteric arteries, which are branches from the aorta. It's then going to pass through the digestive system capillaries, and this is when you're going to absorb nutrients from the food that you eat. Then it's going to pass into the superior and inferior mesenteric veins. Now it's going to go into a portal vessel called the hepatic portal vein, which is going to take that blood to the liver, and now it's going to pass through a second set of capillary networks, which are capillaries inside the liver and the liver is going to make adjustments and check over what we ate and make sure there's no toxins and all sorts of stuff that we'll cover in chapter 24. The blood is then picked up by the hepatic vein and returned to the inferior vena cava. So one big take home message for now is the hepatic portal vein and the hepatic vein are not the same structure. So I see students a lot of times will write one when they meant the other. You have to be careful with these two because just the addition or, or elimination of that one word portal refers to two completely separate vessels. And then a last little look at fetal circulation. We covered changes to the fetal heart in chapter 20, so I'm not going to talk about the heart again. I'm going to talk about some other aspects of the fetal circulation. So in the fetus, oxygenated blood arrives to the fetus through the umbilical vein, which is connected to the placenta. So here is a little picture of our fetal circulation. So we have the placenta right here, and the umbilical cord is going to be a collection of the umbilical vein and umbilical arteries. And notice that the umbilical vein is in red because it is carrying oxygenated blood. There's not that often you see arteries that are red, but this is one of those cases. So the umbilical vein connects up with the baby's inferior vena cava 
through a vessel called the ductus venosus. So the ductus venosus is a structure that connects the umbilical vein to the inferior vena cava. After birth, this structure becomes the ligamentum venosum. And if you look at the liver in an adult, so underneath the liver, there is a couple of ligaments uh, on the bottom. One of them is the ligamentum venosum, which was part of the ductus venosus. And the other one is called the round ligament, which is the remnants of that umbilical vein. Then deoxygenated blood leaves the baby and goes back to the mother through the umbilical artery, which is shown branching off down here. So it branches off from the internal iliac arteries and it runs back to the placenta where it will go back into the mother's circulation to pick up more oxygen. So after birth, part of the umbilical arteries get drafted to serve as a different artery and part of it turns into a ligament. So here is the picture from your textbook that's again showing the umbilical uh, cord that has the umbilical vein which is in red, the umbilical arteries which are in purple because it's a mix of oxygenated and deoxygenated uh, blood. And again you can see how the umbilical vein comes in through the ductus venosus. Um, once it joins the inferior vena cava it'll go through the systemic circulation as we talked about before. You do have those changes to the heart that we covered in the last chapter and then after the blood goes out through the aorta, the aorta will branch and then when it gets to the uh, in internal iliac arteries, it'll become the umbilical artery and go back to the placenta. And that is it for chapter 21. That is the end of our cardiovascular system unit.